Uh, a statement has just come through from Lambeth Palace Press Office. Um, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, uh, is stepping down uh, from that role. Um, I'm going to continue with this topic and I'm very aware that it is a difficult one. I'm very aware that discussions around child abuse, child sexual abuse, child physical abuse are, are tough things to listen to, but they're tougher things to experience. And given that the nature of the conversation we were having in the first hour was all about, and I think it came through in those three calls we took, four calls we took, it was all about what more we need to do to really get it, to really get into our bones, not just intellectually, but in our bones, how damaged and hurt and ruined the lives of people who've been sexually abused can be. And I say can be, and I, my guess is it's more often than not, but I'm not going to speak for anybody who's been abused. If you've been abused and you have recovered and you have placed it where it needs to be and you are thriving, I rejoice for you. So I'm not going to assume that everybody's experience or the aftermath of it for everybody is the same because it won't be. I'll let you speak for yourselves. But I, I make no apologies for continuing with this topic, even though I know it's very difficult and a health warning for some of the um, elements of abuse that you may well hear in the next hour in people's own testimony and account of, of their own lives. Um, but let me read this statement to you from the Archbishop of Canterbury, some of it anyway. Uh, it says, uh, in his own words, it's in the first person, he says, having sought the gracious permission of His Majesty the King, I have decided to resign as Archbishop of Canterbury. The Macon Review has exposed the long-maintained conspiracy of silence about the heinous abuses of John Smythe. When I was informed in 2013 and told that police had been notified, I believed wrongly that an appropriate resolution would follow. It is very clear that I must take personal and institutional responsibility for the long and re-traumatising period between 2013 and 2024. He goes on to say, it's my duty to honour my constitutional and church responsibilities. So exact timings will be decided once a review of necessary obligations have been completed, including those in England and in the Anglican Communion worldwide. Anglican Communion. Um, uh, he go, I won't read it in full because it's very long, but he goes on to say, the last few days have renewed my long-felt and profound sense of shame at the historic safeguarding failures of the Church of England. For nearly 12 years, I have struggled to introduce improvements. Um, that's an interesting statement because it rather flies in the face of the statement that uh, what happened in 2013 couldn't happen now. Um, he goes on to say it is for others to judge what has been done. Um, and it continues. Um, I'll read more of it uh, throughout the hour. But Charlotte Lynch joins me, LBC's reporter, who spoke to us just an hour ago outside Lambeth Palace. And it was beginning to look untenable and it turned out to be so, Charlotte. Well, absolutely, Sheila. This pressure had been mounting. Of course, this is uh, very different to a statement he previously released after the making review was published, where he said he had actually reflected on his position, uh, but decided not to resign. And it's where this uh, almost outcry came from, really. A petition was started uh, by members of the clergy, several uh, prominent bishops, including the bishop, uh, the Archbishop of Newcastle, uh, calling on Justin Welby to resign as the Archbishop of Canterbury and several victims of John Smythe as well, uh, coming out and saying that they didn't believe he could carry on in his position after that review uh, exposed that he was told in 2013 uh, about the extent of those crimes, or at least about, um, maybe not the full extent, but about at least one victim. Um, and he has said in his statement, as you just mentioned there, that he believed wrongly that an appropriate resolution uh, would follow. He said it's very clear he must take personal and institutional responsibility for the long and re-traumatising period uh, that's now taken place since 2013. Now, um, it felt like there was certainly going to be something else he had to say, particularly after the Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, also commented earlier uh, and refused to back Justin Welby, refused to say outright whether or not he should quit as the Archbishop of Canterbury, instead saying that uh, John Smythe's victims had
had been failed very, very badly, but not commenting directly uh, on Justin Welby's position. This statement, as you say, Sheila, uh, very long, but it's a written statement. Uh, it comes after what looks as though is, he says, a period of reflection. Uh, he's also said in this statement that he asks everybody to keep his wife, Caroline, and his children in their prayers as they've been his most important support throughout his ministry. He said, I'm eternally grateful uh, for their <laughs> sacrifice. And of course, he said, above all else, uh, his deepest commitment is uh, to the person of Jesus Christ uh, and God. Uh, he's ended that statement by saying, uh, the bearer of sins and burdens of the world, uh, the hope of every person, ends that statement from Justin Welby. Thanks very much indeed, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte Lynch, LBC's reporter, speaking to us there outside Lambeth Palace. Um, I mean, clearly the impact uh, on the Church of England is substantial here, uh, a moment like this, um, where an Archbishop of Canterbury has to step down in such circumstances. Um, and feel free to comment on that uh, if, if it's uh, uh, you know an, an aspect that you're interested in. I am interested in it too, um, you know, as a news story. But I think it, that it, this is one man and it's one institution. I mean, it's an incredibly important role and it's an incredibly important institution. But it, it, the, the the thing that interests me more is how we get to where we should always have been on child sexual abuse, both stopping it, reporting it and helping the victims of it. And letting them speak, and I know it's not it's it's not easy listening when somebody tells you their story. You know, the last three stories that we heard on the program, not easy listening. But uh, Christelle, our first caller in the first hour, she, we owe it to her to listen. We owe it to Patrick who called to listen. We owe it to anyone. Um, our last caller, whose son uh, had been abused by his father, we owe it to them to listen. And that little boy that she was talking about, who's 10 now, but first revealed his father's abuse at the age of six. I mean, he's he's been given counselling by some of the best in the business, NSPCC, Bernardo's, other organisations, and is now permanently on their books for the time being. He needs that much help. He's so broken by it. And he's 10. And he won't magically become a well 25-year-old or a happy father of three down the line. He won't magically become those things. It takes effort. It takes openness. It takes financial support for therapy. Christelle, abused from the age of seven to the age of 10 by her great uncle, our first caller in the first hour. She's funding her own education because she was too shattered to receive the state education that she was given as a child. She couldn't function as a child. Of course she couldn't. She wasn't getting any help, so of course she couldn't. And as an adult, she kept telling us, didn't she? I'm 40. It was her birthday yesterday. I, I'm 40, she said, 40 plus one day, and I'm only just learning my times tables. Just think about that. She was a bright, articulate woman speaking to me. This isn't somebody who can't learn. This is somebody who couldn't learn as a child because she was so shattered by what had happened to her.